Well, even those who are not professing Christians in our society have this general concept that Lent is this season of self-discipline in some way. Some people, you know, give up uh, certain things that they like or certain habits. Uh, they may decide, I'm not going to eat chocolate for six weeks or or fish, I, I mean, rather meat on Friday. I'll have only fish. Or I won't swear on the golf course for six weeks. Or, or uh, I'll quit sneaking cigarettes while I drive my car for six weeks. But Lent is meant to be so much more than conquering some peccadilloes and bad habits. It's really meant in churches to be a time when we remember and journey back to visiting and recalling the greatest life ever lived by far. The finest man who's ever walked this planet. Head, shoulders, trunk above everybody else. Not only because of his moral perfection and the unbelievable way in which he treated others, but also because of his impact. Who else has had this kind of world-altering consequence to his life. Who else? Nobody. When you think about it, billions with a B of people now and down through the ages for two millennia have not just honored the memory of Jesus of Nazareth or acknowledged him to be a great man or dopped their cap in recognition of him, but far more than that, have worshipped him and have claimed him as their Lord. That's how profound his impact has been. And when we go back to look at his life, as we will be doing throughout this season of Lent, we're starting today, and I decided that we'll begin near the very end which is kind of unusual, but not that unusual. Why, it was just Friday evening, coincidentally, that my wife Jeannie and I watched on our, our TV a recent film release that took uh, the beginning of the film at the end of the main character's life, and then the rest of the movie was kind of a flashback bringing you up to that point. So this is a typical device in films and in novels and so on. That's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be looking in this message that I'm entitling The Darkest Hour at what happened in the final 12 hours before the death of Jesus of Nazareth. That's what we're going to be considering together. Our text will be from a book called Matthew, one of the four biographies of Jesus found in the New Testament. We're going to be reading Matthew chapter 26. Here's the scene. The, this, the closest followers of Jesus, we call them the disciples, have shared with him their final meal together. This was not some ordinary meal, you know, take out from McDonald's or pizza delivered or something like that. I mean, this is the meal of the year. This was the centerpiece of all Jewish holidays, what the Thanksgiving meal around our family tables with the turkey and all its fixings is to Americans, Passover was to the Jews and more. And that important meal Jesus celebrated with the 12. And then after dinner, one of them, the traitor Judas, excused himself to <clears throat> take care of a little bit of business and he disappeared to do his dirty deed. Meanwhile, the rest sat around the table and Jesus took bread and a cup and he passed it around, thereby instituting this sacrament that we are going to relive and experience in just a few minutes. This was the very night that communion was given to the church. And then do you remember what they did after the bread and the cup had been passed? Well, they probably put their shoes back on and cleaned up the place a little bit. And then they left. And they went just outside the walls of Jerusalem to a place on a little hill called the Mount of Olives where they entered into a garden 
known as Gethsemane. The word literally means oil press. It's because during working hours, the workmen would take the harvested olives from the nearby groves and they would press them and squeeze them so that olive oil came out. Well, Jesus in the garden of the oil press is about to be pressed and squeezed like never before. And we're going to see what happened by following along Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. Words are on the screen. Follow the story with me, please. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that is James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. May God grant us insight into this portion of his word. A film was released in theaters a little over a year ago called Darkest Hour, starring British actor Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill, and actually that was a role, I think he won the Best Actor Oscar for that a year ago. It's an amazing film that captures, indeed, a very dark hour in history. It is May 1940, a fateful month. The Nazi blitzkrieg has just about overwhelmed France. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, is forced to resign in disgrace because he had promised his people that he, by his brilliant diplomacy, had achieved lasting peace with Hitler. And all of those promises collapsed. And so the king offered Winston Churchill the opportunity to form a new government. Well, we think of Churchill today as a great man, but that was not how his contemporaries viewed him at all. He was the last one anyone would have picked to succeed. And as soon as Churchill was installed in office as prime minister, the tremendous pressure began, especially coming from the doves inside the government. Those who wanted to make peace at all costs still scarred from the effects of the First World War not that long ago, they were desperate to avoid any conflict and were willing to surrender and make peace with Hitler even at the cost of their freedom and even at the cost of betrayal of their allies. Nevertheless, there was a tremendous pressure on Churchill to give in. But in an amazing act of courage and determination, the British Prime Minister made a different decision. And you've got to watch how the film ends. The Prime Minister. Turning once again to the question of invasion, I would observe that there has never been a period 
in all these long centuries of which we boast, when an absolute guarantee against invasion could have been given to our people. But I have myself full confidence that if all do their duty, if nothing is neglected, and the best arrangements are made as they are being made, we shall prove ourselves once more able to defend our island home, to ride out the storm of war, and to outlive the menace of tyranny. If necessary, for years, if necessary, alone. At any rate, that is what we are, are going to try to do. That is the result of His Majesty's government, every man of them. To your right of that is the will of Parliament and the nation. <laughs> and the French Republic, linked together in their cause and in their need, will defend to the death their native soil. Aiding each other like good comrades to the utmost of their strength. <laughs> Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have, have fallen, or may fall, into the, the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of the Nazi rule. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end! We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with, with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender! And if... And if which I, I, I do not for a moment believe. This island or large part of it were, were, were subjugated and starving. Then our empire, we on the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, yeah. would carry on the struggle. Yeah. Until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Amazing courage of one man for a time standing absolutely alone, making a decision that changed the course of history. I mean, think about it. What if Churchill had given in to the pressure and surrendered to Hitler? 
There would have been no D-Day, of course, because America could have, America could have never launched an invasion of Europe from across the Atlantic without the island of Britain as its base. And with Hitler's military power freed up to be unleashed in its full against Russia, probably Hitler would have won the Second World War. And how would our lives, the last 79 years, in the lifetime of almost all of us, be different if that one man had not made a courageous decision? Well, this morning, we're going back in time another 1,900 years further to see another solitary man about to be deserted by everybody, all alone, making an unbelievably significant solitary decision that would indeed change the course of human events for 2,000 years. Think about how the forces of darkness were gathering. It was indeed, you could say, the darkest hour of mankind. As Christ alone stood against all the dark forces marshaled against him, pressuring him to yield, all of that darkness having already cooked up the conspiracy that would result in the most tragic and terrible crime ever committed by the human race, the only truly perfectly innocent man would be tried, charged, condemned, and executed for crimes he did not commit, and all of that was pressing in upon him and had Jesus, which would have been perfectly understandable, said, no thanks, I'm out of here. If he had done that, then the cross, the center of our faith, would have never happened. The crucifixion would have never occurred. And therefore, the resurrection, the defeat for all time of death would have never occurred. But all because that one man stood alone against the darkness is our faith real and powerful to us today. But think about what he went through. In fact, as he expressed his agony in prayer, notice the visual symbol that comes to mind. He says, Father, is there any way that this cup, this cup of suffering, this terrible poisonous drink could somehow be passed from me and I not have to drink it. I think we can all kind of relate to the idea of not wanting to drink something that we know will taste terrible. Did you ever as a kid have to take some medicine? Your mom made you take it and it tasted awful. Have any of you Ever had the delightful experience of a colonoscopy? Anybody here? Hmm? Okay. Probably none of you have yet, but boy, whew, you've got something to look forward to, I'll tell you. You drink this stuff. Basically, it works like Drano. It kind of just <laughs> flushes the pipes clean kind of tastes like Drano too, doesn't it? So everybody has a little bit of reluctance to drink that cup, but this is nothing compared to the cup of pain and suffering and rejection, the emotional, spiritual, and physical agony that awaited him in the next 12 hours. Why would his human self, Jesus was both God and man, together, why would that human part of him not cringe and shrink back? And think about this, what I'll call the curse of omniscience. You know, omniscience means you, you know everything, and there are clues all sprinkled through the Bible Alan, you've seen this many times in your teaching that Jesus demonstrated this knowledge of things that was supernatural. Nobody could have known what he knew. He knew the future. He knew what would happen. He could look inside people's eyes to their souls and know exactly who they were and what their 
deepest sins or their deepest needs were. And we might think naively, wow, wouldn't it be great to know everything, huh? Wouldn't it be nice to invest in the stock market or go to Las Vegas knowing everything? Except there is definitely a dark side to omniscience. And Jesus experiences it now because he knows exactly what's going to happen to him if he chooses to do it God's way. In fact, he may even already be feeling that agony that awaits him in the coming hours. So no wonder he's dreading it. But in what I believe is the central teaching and lesson of the Garden of Gethsemane, we discover the incredible power of the will. The power of the mind to overrule the body. The power we have to choose and to thereby do what a part of us does not want to do. The power of the will. Can we have that screen up please? Think about the power that comes from the decision Jesus made to say, I will choose your will, God, not what every fiber in my body prefers, but I will choose your will. That's amazing, the power of the will. What we see happening in the Garden of Gethsemane is the battlefield of the mind and we've all spent a lot of time on that battlefield of the mind maybe every day we battles you see within our mind because it is the will it is the choice it is the soul or the mind that dictates what we do we never do anything except what we decide to do our body takes the directions from the brain we choose and on this battlefield of the mind the greatest struggles are fought. And that's what we see happening. You know, if somebody was casually whistling and walking through the Garden of Gethsemane on that moonlit night, they might conclude, well, nothing happening here. Just a few guys snoozing under some trees and there's one other guy alone. It seems like maybe he's praying. He seems to be awake. But, but this is calm and peaceful. But in fact... It was the raging battlefield where the forces of evil were seeking to redirect the Son of God from his appointed mission. And it is on that battlefield that the great victory is won. In fact, it was because Jesus won the battle of the will and made his final decision that the cross and the empty tomb could happen. He set it in motion by this very choice. Now to accept the will of God is often a struggle for us. Many of you have gone through times when you wonder, you don't understand God's will, to accept it seems to be the most difficult thing. There's a Christian author by the name of Nancy Guthrie who went through a very difficult time in her life. Here's what happened. She uh, gave birth to a little girl who was born with a rare genetic disorder, a metabolic disorder that meant her body could not process food and nutrition and therefore could not survive. And this little baby, in spite of the best of medical science, only hung on for six months. After the death, Nancy understandably was in grief and struggling to deal with her, her emotions and she she wanted to act like a Christian and she thought now come on I should get over this what's wrong here why am I not able to accept God's will and in her struggle coincidentally providentially one day she was reading in Matthew chapter 26 and it was as if a spotlight from heaven came down and shone on these verses and suddenly she got it and she took her pen and she wrote in the margin of her Bible at Matthew 26 Jesus understands later on she went on to share this experience and has summed it up in this way 
Jesus understands what it is like to experience sorrow so heavy that it feels like it is pressing the life out of you. Remember, Gethsemane was the oil press. It helps me, Nancy writes, to know that Jesus wrestled with the Father's plan even as he sought to submit to it because I too have wrestled with the Father's plan as I have sought to submit to it. Now, some of you can relate very well because you've been in a garden of Gethsemane struggling with the will of God and others of you, well, you're going to be there someday. And what we learn from this profound passage and Jesus' timeless words and his decision, Lord, your will be done, not my will. I surrender to you. God, I may not understand everything you're doing. I may not know why. It may be a long time, even years before it makes sense. But I will nevertheless choose to trust you and follow you and believe in you. That's what Jesus decided. When you think about it, his decision was to follow God's way, which was the only way. If there'd been a plan B, if there'd been some other way to accomplish the redemption of the human race and not had the death of his son on the cross, I'm sure God would have accomplished it, but this was the only way. If Jesus had said no to the will of his father, why, he would have been spared and the rest of us would have been lost. But in that prayer of surrender, thy will be done, we find, ironically, that surrendering is the way to victory in the spiritual sense. There's a Christian uh, novelist by the name of Jan Karen, who's written a number of best-selling novels based in a mythical North Carolina mountain town called Mitford. And in these novels, the main character who carries on through all the books is the pastor of the local Episcopal church. Father Tim is his name. And at many times, through the course of people going through the ups and downs and the crises and challenges and sorrows of life, many times Father Tim appeals to his people in these words. Pray the prayer that never fails. What is the prayer that never fails? God, your will be done. That is the prayer that brings about God's purpose in our lives and actually sets us free. I invite you to consider praying that prayer that never fails today and allowing God's will to have its force in your life. Well, before we close, let me take you back one more time to 1940 in London. Not long after his dramatic speech to Parliament, galvanizing his people to prepare themselves for the great struggle, Winston Churchill gave another address to his nation. And here is the final sentence of that message. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that If the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. No matter all the great things, all of the wonderful things that Jesus did in his lifetime, the amazing miracles, the healings, the life-altering encounters, the timeless teachings that change the paradigm of the world about how to live beyond all of those, I am convinced that it was here in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus had his finest hour. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Lord, thank you that you had the courage to say yes to the will of the Father and to go all the way to the cross for us. And thank you that in this sacrament, we can now celebrate and remember. We pray for this time we spend gathered at your table, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. 